Now, first I want to explain something. We are now starting with uh, part three of the uh, uh, lecture. So application of metaphysics on theories and issues of the micro and the macrocosmos. And um, first I want to explain to you something about doing observations in physics. Uh, some basic thoughts. Uh, when doing scientific research, there are, according to the Theosophia, at least two living beings involved. First, of course, the observer, the physicist, and the choices that the researcher makes affect very much the object of observation. And these choices, then I mean, for instance, the design of the experiment. And you can say the design of experiment, but the way you, you, you try to check your assumptions, your hypotheses, your theories, is uh, something to consider very precisely because uh, you have to take into account that you can only see the things that if they are incorporated in the test that you have designed. So you should think about that in a very uh, clever way. Next is that the object of observation, let's, let's take for example a uh, um, atomic, a subatomic particle that you want to investigate. That we are also dealing with the living beings. For instance, uh, a light particle, a photon. Now if we we talk from metaphysics about measurements on atomic particles, then we mean that we actually are influencing the particles because every measurement is in fact a communication between beings. For instance, you have to, to use a light beam to spot or detect where a certain particle is. And then you are in fact touching it or influencing it in its behavior. Well, these uh, uh, particles, these living beings, micro-living beings, have a free will and thus sometimes react unpredictably because they may have always certain patterns, but some of them deviate from these patterns within certain probability limits. Now, from physics, especially from quantum physics, we know the so-called uncertainty principle. What is that uncertainty principle? That is the principle that the speed and the location of an atomic particle cannot be determined simultaneously. More about that later. What physics can do is make predictions based on probability, based on statistics based on mathematical functions where you can make an educated guess where a particle will be at a certain amount or what the speed is of that particle. But this does not automatically imply that the cause-effect relationships are always understood. It is only a mathematical description of the process you are watching. Now let's move to the practical application of what we have built up in thoughts in the first two parts of the lecture and let's have a look at the microcosmos and the issues in that. We have uh, some built up some thoughts in outline on the boundaries of life, on how we look to nature, what force and matter are and what motion are from both the point of view of metaphysics, represented by the Theosophia, and from the point of view of physics. Now we are going to consider some issues from physics from the angle of metaphysics, and we will start with the microcosm. The microcosm must some there are three issues I want to tell you something about. First, about the standard atom model. And the question there is, can the atom be split infinitely? So in 
ever smaller parts? That is a question. Another question is about quantum physics. There are many theories in quantum physics which are all based on probability, but there are no real cause-effect models in quantum physics. We will talk about that later. And the third is about the so-called Higgs field or the Higgs particle theory, which is explaining that this Higgs field or Higgs particle gives mass to other particles. Now we will discuss these three issues and we will start with the atom model theory. And the model of an atom is somewhat similar to our solar system. Just as the sun is the center in our solar system, the nucleus of the atom is also the center around which electrons rotate with a great speed. Here you have a picture of it, and you probably know it. It is the model that was proposed by the physicist Niels Bohr. And everybody knows the particles you have in the nucleus. You have the proton with a positive electric charge. You have the neutron with no uh, electric charge in the nucleus. And around the nucleus you have the circling electrons. And they are colored green, uh, red. And they, are, uh, they have a negative electric charge. Physics now recognizes an even larger number of subatomic particles in the so-called standard model, and it looks like this. Uh, we have uh, again the nucleus and the electrons, and these particles are again subdivided uh, uh, into quarks and all kinds of other smaller uh, particles and the question now is can this identification of even smaller sub 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 particles go on infinitely and the answer from the theosophica theosophia is that this division is indeed uh, infinitely that means that you can Science will uh, discover in the future an endless number of sub 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 atomic particles because this is all all these particles are composite beings of smaller particles and this is actually based on the first proposition of the secret doctrine the boundlessness because this applies both to the macrocosmos, but also to the microcosmos. Everything is endlessly, infinitely divisible. So that is the first issue we can answer from metaphysics or from the Theosophical. Then we go to the next issue uh, in quantum physics. Uh, an issue that has long occupied physics is whether small atomic particles should be considered as particles or as waves. Now this is an issue that is already dealt with for more than 200 years. And I will tell you a little bit about this. Uh, because in the year 1805, so more than two centuries back, uh, there was a physicist called uh, Thomas Young who did an experiment which is called the two-slit experiment. He did uh, the experiment with light, with light rays, but you can do the same experiment also with, uh, for instance, uh, electron rays. Now, the idea about this uh, experiment is as follows. If you have a light source and you see in the left part you see a light bulb and if you let you make in the, the small wall one slit and you let the light go through this one slit then you see on the wall behind 
this uh, one slit, you see one uh, stripe of light. So if you think about this, then you can imagine that the light which goes through this one slit is uh, light particles or photon, and that you see projected on the wall behind this one slit. But then if you change the experiment if, if you make two slits which are next to each other then you see something which is maybe not what you expect and that is that you see not two slits but you see a whole array of slits and in the picture at the right side which you see you can see what happens if you have two light sources which emit light and which are or which also could uh, represent, for instance, uh, a wave front in water. And if you consider these two points as uh, the sources of waves, either of uh, light or of uh, water waves, it doesn't matter, then you see that if you consider the waves propagating, that they uh, mix as waves. And then you see that at some points the waves are cancel each other out and at other points they amplify each other. And that is what you see also in the example of light at the left hand side of, the, of this uh, slide. Where light and dark are cancelling each other because now suddenly it are waves of light. Now this phenomena that something is both of a particle character and as a light character is something that have puzzled physicists two centuries long and from this puzzle the quantum physics part of science was born. And we think that quantum physics which is a type of physics that is, is based on theories that assumes that uh, whether you look at the phenomena or want to explain a phenomena that you see either as a particle phenomena or as a wave phenomena is mainly described with let's say uh, probability uh, expectations or probability functions in mathematics and um, it is much easier to understand if you uh, connect this with or relate this to the principle of the Theosophia. Um, and if you consider this from the point of view of the Theosophia, then you look at every particle as a composite being. So if we look at light as a photon, as a light particle, then we can see it as a as a composite being, that light particle is not only having a material vehicle, but also an astral nature around it. So it is not only on this one material plane, but it is also an existence on other planes. What I explained at the beginning of the lecture, that every being has an existence on four different planes. Now every particle moves because of its composed nature also through the substance of the ether and causes a vortex or wave in that ether which is not on the physical plane but on the ether plane and the wave effect in the ether is again translated into the physical plane because I explained that the trigger of one force on one plane can trigger a force on another plane and that is why then the wave phenomena becomes again visible on our physical plane. Now understanding the cause effect relationship between particle and wave is well illustrated with water waves. I have uh, already shown you this picture uh, before. The particle makes a swirling motion on the spot because there are, they are all in a different phase and they pass on the wave. Now 
this, uh, this, this, uh, this demonstrating the ether as a fact in nature has been a form of a firm point of debate in physics for many years, and it still is. So there are very few physicists who assume that there is really an ether. Um, but this is the explanation I've given from the point of view of metaphysics. There is another issue in physics, and it is called in uh, physics the uncertainty principle. Because uh, indeed, measurements have shown the following. If you want to determine for an atomic particle the velocity and the position, it cannot be determined simultaneously. You have to choose to measure either the velocity or the position, but you cannot do it all at, uh, at once. And you see that to, with the present models in physics, you can make predictions based on probability estimates, mathematical functions, but it is all uh, within a certain uh, contour where you can forecast it, but it all remains uncertain. This is called the uncertainty principle of Schrodinger and Heisenberg, by the way. Uh, the theosophical explanation is that in measurements, particles do in fact show free will. If you are going to measure, then you have this communication with you and your instruments and the particle, and with that uh, measurements you are in fact influencing this particle because it is a living being and it is not so easy to not so difficult to understand it because if you have in a certain area in a city uh, the police standing with the car then you are watching your speed because if they are checking on speed then you are warned if you see a police car so we also react on what we see the mathematical models in quantum physics describe this phenomena using statistical methods, but they do not explain what is happening, they do not see cause-effect relations. So, to sum it up, the particle character and the wave character of atomic particles relate as cause and effect, because the particle is composite the cost effects on the plane of ether are translated into effects on the material plane and the behavior of a particle is difficult to predict because of the particle's free will. Now we go to the next issue in physics, in the microcosmos, uh, and then we will have a look at the dynamic equilibrium of an atomic being in an emanation force field. In all probability, in 2012 at CERN in, uh, in uh, Geneva, with the Large Hadron Collider uh, setup, it was established that the subatomic particle called the Higgs particle has been demonstrated. And this Higgs particle, particle is of a fundamental importance. According to the theories, it must exist to make the standard atomic model of the microcosmos complete and correct. And this Higgs particle is the messenger particle of the Higgs field, the Higgs force field, which is present throughout the universe. And because the, uh, of the Higgs field, and now mark my words, all the other particles gain mass or inertia, according to physicists. And it is for the latter in particular that this is so interesting to mention. What is the cause of that mass? Physicists today view the mass of an elementary particle in the atom as a kind of vortex or swirl within a force field. And this Higgs field 
is such a force field that completely fills the universe. It's everywhere. And elementary particles that have a strong interactions with that Higgs field seem to have more mass when you try to make them move. How can we imagine that Higgs field and the interactions of atomic particles with it? One of the most understandable analogies is a cocktail party for physicists, where an unknown person and a famous physicist, Mr. Higgs for instance, try to get from one end of the room to the other where this cocktail party is. Those present do not know the first man and he smoothly walks past everyone and he has a mass zero. Mr. Higgs, however, attracts huge attention because everyone knows him and has a few questions they would like to ask him. The idea is not that the people in the room form some kind of physical barrier, as if the size of a particle determines its mass, no. It is the recognition of this familiar person which creates more interaction, chats, and this, those little chats, conversations take time and lead to delay, to inertia. The researchers confirm that what we call our mass is not a fixed property of us, uh, not linked to our bodies, no, our mass appears to be the effect of interaction of exchanges between our body and in the field in which we exist and move. The key to a greater understanding lies in the theosophical rationale that elementary atomic particles are also embodied consciousness. So when we talk about elementary particles and their interactions with each other, that word interaction in the Theosophia actually means much more than the researchers suspect. It is about an interaction of beings who are aware of each other and react on each other. The fact that these are very low developed beings does not alter this. As mentioned earlier, according to the Theosophia, each of the planes of existence in the cosmos, like our material plane, has its own ether, which we can think of as a reflection of the original ether, but on a more material level. And it is precisely this ancient idea of the ether that now seems to have been rediscovered in the form of the new theory about the Higgs field. Or at least there seems to be a very interesting similarity between the Higgs field and ether. So very promising. Now we will turn to some theories of the macrocosmos and namely on the dynamic equilibrium position of a being in an emanation force field in the cosmos. First a brief recap to remind you of a number of ideas I uh, presented in the first part of this lecture. When we talk about motion, first thing is that self-motion is characteristic of a living being. That is very important thought. And in emanation four fields, being are attracted and repelled. The bipolarity of forces. Each being itself determines the harmony of forces in such a field on the basis of free will, that's also an important thought. And the last thought of importance is that emanation force fields are electromagnetic fields of various kinds of electromagnetism. We will explore the following two theories. 
gravity theory and relativity theory, and second, the theory of the electric or plasma universe, which will I explain to you. Now, let us have a look at the theory of gravity, and let's have a look, uh, for example, how the interaction is between living beings such as man and animals on Earth. And let's have a look how uh, these living beings can uh, have an influence on their own state, on their own, uh, uh, how their um, state of consciousness can have an influence how they are in harmony with this field in which they live. Madame Blavatsky points out that the uh, animals, for instance, frequently use instinctively in nature uh, their ability to change their polarity. They change the degree of the attraction and repulsion in relation to the field of gravity in which they live here on Earth. And I will give you an example of that. First, the fishes. To ascend and to descend faster than can be understood on the basis of hydrostatics and hydrodynamics, on the basis of the normal control of the equilibrium when they are swimming uh, and the buoyancy control they have uh, with their bladder, for instance, then if you would start designing experiments in which you take into account this hydrostatics and hydrodynamics and how they control the buoyancy with this bladder, then you would probably detect in many cases that these fishes do that more rapidly than you would expect. And this is also the case with whales. She also mentions the whales with regard to how rapid they can descend and dive to the depths of the oceans and also can ascend and jump out of the seas as you see on these pictures. Uh, and the same applies to the birds in the air. They also instinctively can adjust their polarity in relation to the gravity field and they can rise faster or descend faster when they dive, like uh, hawks for instance, with an enormous speed, then you would expect based on the laws of aerodynamics. And also she mentions humans too can learn to change the polarity of their bodies based on their willpower and that is the uh, ability to levitate. Well, this is an example of how living beings can change their, with their uh, consciousness, whether uh, it is done in a very self-conscious way or in a, in a more uh, instinctive way, that doesn't matter, but that there is based on the actions of consciousness, there is a change possible, an influence possible, of a being on the field in which it lives. Now, we are going to scale up to the, uh, the scale of the solar system. I have here a picture of our solar system, and the harmony in which uh, this these planets orbit around the Sun, I have explained uh, two weeks back, that these uh, motions of the planets have been described already centuries ago by Johannes Kepler, an astronomer, who discovered certain uh, laws. And I have mentioned especially the third law, which is called the law of harmony. And this harmony law indicates that there is a limited permissible fluctuation in the elliptical orbit and the orbital period, the cycle, 
which the planets uh, follow. Um, and from the Theosophia, we, we would like to point out that the free will of the consciousness operating behind the planet is, is something that is a decisive factor herein. That is what she points out. Because the field of gravity is not changing, she explains, but on the other hand, the motions of the planets change. Uh, to give you an example, at the moment, the cycle of the year is 365 and a quarter of days, but on the long run, this period is 360 days. And this was all, uh, all, all known in the Theosophia and in the mystery schools. And that is why also the circle is divided in 360 degrees. Uh, so this is very old knowledge that the planets do change their cycle period. They do change the shape and the dimensions of the elliptic orbit. And that is caused by the consciousness working behind the planets. Then we go to the theory of gravity. I have just shown to you that 95% uh, uh, of the uh, hypothetical unobservable matter and energy must be assumed to make the theory of gravity to be consistent with the observed phenomena. And it is as if black matter and black energy in this theory seems to be substitute for the currently unaccepted ether theory. After all, the everywhere present Higgs field in the cosmos also points to the theory or the existence of ether. Now, a few words about the uh, theory of relativity of Albert Einstein and also related to the gravity force field. Following the outcome of certain experiments in physics, which I will not explain in detail, but if you have questions I can uh, explain something about this, it was assumed in physics that ether does not exist. And in the 20th century, another version of Newton's theory of gra gravitational force was the, designed by Albert Einstein, the theory of relativity, and in his thought experiments, as he called them, he assumed that the force or information exchange in the cosmos is limited by the speed of the assumed limited speed of light. Einstein was of course a great universal and above all an honest scientist who also dared to question even his own work. And there are aspects in the theory of relativity that do correspond with uh, the ideas of theosophy, but there are also ideas that differ. First, some correspondences. Time, space and matter and force are relative and related to each other in this theory, so they are not independent factors, but they are related to each other. That's point one, and that is also in line with the theosophy. Second, our manifested universe, universe is not infinite. And third, space is spherical. These are correspondences, but there is a very important point of difference. According to Einstein, the curved space Time, and I've given a picture of that, how it is normally uh, uh, depicted in all kinds of papers about this theory of relativity. This curved space-time, he says, is the cause of gravity. But theosophy disagrees because the cause of gravity is the emanation force field, FOHAT, of a great cosmic being. And there we see a great difference. Then we come to the interesting concept of the 
electric or plasma universe theory. A few decades ago, this concept was conceived by the Nobel Prize laureate Hannes Alphen, a Swedish physicist. In 1970, he received this uh, Nobel Prize for physics. And first, let me explain what is exactly this theory about plasma. Plasma is a gaseous substance, often an ionized gas, which consists of freely charged particles which react strongly to electromagnetic fields, also called the fourth aggregate states of matter. The plasma can therefore conduct electric currents and generate magnetic fields which can cause, among other things, the plasma to contract into filaments, fiber-like structures. And these things can easily be seen in space. These electric currents are called Birkeland currents after their Danish discoverer. And according to scientists, and I'm talking about scientists in electrical engineering, professors, retired professors most of the time, they state that everything makes good sense when you base the explanation of these phenomena in space on the so-called Maxwell equations or Maxwell electromagnetic laws that did not change uh, after Faraday and Maxwell drafted these uh, equations, it was never proven to be false. And the interesting thing is that these laws work the same in the laboratory on Earth as also in the universe. And what are the interfaces between the Theosophia and this new scientific insight about this plasma or electric universe? These interfaces consist of, first, the principle of self-motion, and second, the emanation of force fields, FOHAT, which are electromagnetic in nature. First, self-motion. I told you that self-motion is a characteristic of a living being, according to Plato. Therefore, the movement of celestial bodies in space rotating or moving in a straight line, which we see in nebula, planets and galaxies, amongst others, is already a first indication of life from the point of view of theosophy. Next, the emanation forefields, fohat or fohats, plural, are electromagnetic fields of various kinds. I will give you two examples at the level of the solar system and at the level even higher of the galaxy. Now, first, the level of the solar system. Uh, in the cosmos, we see spiral galaxies. Now, uh, let, sorry, I, I jumped too fast. Our Earth is the, in the electromagnetic field of the Sun. And the auroras at the north and the south pole of the Earth result from the interaction between electrically charged particles in the plasma of the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. In the, on the photos we see the auroras and a few weeks back we had, to our surprise, the possibility to see them even in the north of the Netherlands because these waves came so south that we even could see them at uh, this altitude. And uh, this phenomena is, is really uh, an example of the exchange of these electromagnetic influences from the sun that we can see and detect in our Earth's atmosphere. Then I go to the level of the galaxy, so one level higher. In the cosmos we see spiral galaxies 
that as a whole have a swirling motion. You see here an observation of this swirling motion uh, made by the Spitzer telescope, that is an older telescope, telescope uh, which was uh, launched in space, just like the James Webb is now also taking beautiful pictures, but this is an older one uh, in orbit since 2003. And it took this uh, uh, beautiful picture of a, uh, of a galaxy. And it looks a lot, this picture, like the vortices of electrical particles in atoms or the rotations of the atoms themselves. And they are all of the same character. And as early as 1937, the physicist Hannes Alphen suggested that our galaxy contains a large-scale magnetic field and that charged particles within it move in spiral orbits as a result of that magnetic field. A colleague of Hannes Alphen, Anthony Parat, showed with laboratory experiments and computer simulations based on these uh, Maxwell equations that the simulated evolution so, in time, of a spiral galaxy accurately matches the observed spiral, spiral galaxies in space. So you see here a time series and at the end you see the shape that is very close to the photo of the Spitzer telescope. Now, this is a demonstration how you can have another theory which is giving very close explanations, but is completely different than the theories of gravity. So, I'm going to summarize and draw some conclusions. Today we have shed light on physics, looking from the angle of metaphysics or the Theosophia. We have said that from Theosophia, the boundedness of life, we can conclude that everything is alive or is consciousness and exists eternally. In physics, the existing mentality, the mainstream of physics, assumes a world of inanimate matter. With some physicists, some, some scientists with a new mentality, we see a different approach. They talk about the cosmic consciousness field and also of a non-local universe, a totally new concept. Starting from the Theosophia, we have drawn the picture of nature as follows. Nature is a hierarchy of life. It emerged via emanation and follows. The laws of nature are considered the habitual patterns of cosmic beings and assumes the emanation force fields of, elect of an electromagnetic nature and everything is connected with everything. Concerning force and matter, they both are relative. Force is colored by the source being from which the, the force is emanated. Forces are bipolar and operate instantaneously. And concerning motion, we can recognize self-motion as being characteristic for life. And motion of body and wave as being related as cause and effect. A number of issues in physics are, in our view, more fundamental and better understood from the Theosophia. And research suggestions or recommendations from the Theosophia for science are to recognize life at all levels of the micro and macrocosmos. Assuming the existence, existence of ether as a plane, which is the basis of our material plane and also to investigate the electromagnetic 
nature of different forces. This is the third part of uh, this lecture. And we will now take a break again of three minutes to uh, collect your questions or your remarks. And we will see you in three minutes. Welcome back. The last uh, round of our uh, questions and remarks. Uh, Mariska. Yeah, I'll take the microphone. Um, uh, the, in the chat there's a question. Uh, could it be that the uncertainty principles that make predictions impossible are reactions on harmonic love patterns or also are reactions on trauma or fear in or from higher planes of existence? Well, the, the, the question is not, not so clear to me in the sense that this uncertainty principle is a, is a term that is used in physics, in quantum physics, uh, because it relates to atomic or subatomic particles mm -hmm. uh, and is not uh, in that sense applicable to, uh, let's say, the human field of action. Um, but what I can say is that since we suggest from the Theosophia that the behavior of these uh, subatomic uh, particles uh, can be uh, seen as behavior of living beings, these living beings, uh, when we study them, with our telescopes or uh, whatever instruments we use can be influenced by all kinds of influences from our instruments but maybe also from our own fields that we also uh, radiate or emanate such as our aura, our astral field around us. So, uh, there are many ways in we we can exert influence on these yeah particles or these beings <laughs> subatomic beings uh, and we should realize that that can also come from our own composite nature other than uh, working on the physical field with instrument but also maybe from let's say, uh, our emotional field, our astral field. It is well known, for instance, also when we to, uh, look at uh, bigger living beings like a horse or dogs, that these animals are sensitive for our emotional influences. So I can imagine that uh, this is also the case for smaller particles. I, I don't know. This, uh, there is no real research on in that respect because science, all, 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 all experiments are based on physical interactions, while it should take into account all kinds of other things as well. And th I think this is, as far as I can tell, something about this uh, question. Clear to me. Yeah. Thank you. Another question. Uh, there's one email with two questions in it. I refer to the first one. Does dust become radiant in the future? I've read something like that in the theosophical literature. Yeah, that is, that is correct. That's a correct remark uh, and, and question. In fact, um, I explained... Uh, no, I didn't explain it in these uh, lectures. Uh, that was a, a Dutch lecture. <laughs> uh, so I cannot refer to it. Um, in general, you can say that there are various cycles of evolution, and the big cycle of evolution that our uh, the life on Earth goes through is one of the big cycles. Is that when the Earth starts to um, to embody from, let's say, a more ethereal phase of matter, it starts to clock together and the matter becomes more and more dense, and this is called the um, the arc, the the downward arc, as it is called. So all manifested life is is embodying in in bodies with matter that is denser and denser and denser as time progresses. But then there comes a turning point, and then 
over a long period of time, all matter starts to become more ethereal again. And we are on the upward arc of evolution. And that means that apart from the development of consciousness of us, but also of the, uh, let's say, the atomic uh, living beings, the embodiments and the matter of their bodies is becoming more and more ethereal. And we see that at the moment that the, the most dense chemical elements that we know on Earth are, uh, for instance, the, the types of uranium. There's all these heavy uh, chemical elements. And they start already becoming radioactive. And that means that they fall apart in, in substances, in matters that are lighter because this state of evolution doesn't allow any longer such dense matter. And this process of matter becoming more and more ethereal is, 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 uh, is progressing. And in the end, in the long run, all matter will become radioactive or radiate. And in the in the long uh, in in the in the in the far future, all matter will be radiant, and we will also have bodies of matter which is radiant matter. <laughs> so we will have a kind of bodies which uh, are could be called in a different way uh, bodies of light. <laughs> and that is the on the long run. And then we talk about millions of years, but. So the, the, the matter of which everything is constructed or uh, how bodies are manifested is now of this type of matter of which uranium and all the heavier materials are uh, falling apart in, in, by radioactivity and this will increase in time. Well, you, I think you already answered the second question in this email, because that yeah. was, uh, what do we materially see as uranium decays? Yeah. And you already... Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. More and more chemical uh, elements will start to uh, become radioactive. Yeah. Yes. Uh, next question in the email. If there were no suns or stars, every, everything would be dark. Where does the darkness come from? The darkness comes from the absence of light. And, uh, <laughs> and it is really like this, because you can read in all the old uh, mythologies that uh, there are, in, in all traditions you can, uh, uh, you can see that the, the start of the manifestation starts in all these mythologies with sentences like, let there be light, and there was light. So light is something that is the start of the manifestation of worlds, where for before there, that moment there was there was a as it was a period of rest where everything was indrawn in spiritual worlds, and when the first manifestations usually are called the manifestation of light mm -hmm. as being the first thing before things start to move first, nebulous, uh, which are giving light and things like that, before they start to contract and compact and become more dense and become more dense matter. So uh, light or darkness is absence of light, absence of, of uh, manifested matter, so to speak. And, um, another thing is that you can say that points where light starts, you can call, well, you can call that points where actually from a higher world, an unmanifested world, uh, an emanation comes into a plane where it starts to manifest. And this point is, is called in theosophy a uh, laya center, so where things appear or disappear and so points where there is darkness can also be points where 
actually everything is indrawn again. Uh, so it is no longer manifested anymore on manifested or material planes lower than that. Sounds logical. Yeah. Uh, next question. Yeah. Can you also apply the idea of emanation as a force field to a flower making its way through the asphalt? Yeah. Can you comment on that from an ethical perspective? Well, uh, we have, uh, I have explained that, for instance, the, the field of ether for the, the world, for our globe, is in fact the astral light or the astral model for the physical globe of our Earth. And all manifested beings have a, an astral body or an astral model uh, on which the material uh, physical body is built. So when a plant starts to grow, it follows the model of the astral body of the plant uh, in, and, and uh, so the astral body is already there before the, the physical form of the plant uh, I don't know all the well the stengel the, yeah. <laughs> the, the plant <laughs> the plant the leaves, the flower the, and yeah. the thing that it grows yeah um, when that grows, uh, it follows the model of which is already there on the astral plane, and it has a one of the characteristics of plant is that it is it has a strong uh, growing force. So the emanating field is actually the astral body, uh, and physically. Uh, the, the, the physical part follows that field and it is a very strong field obviously otherwise it cannot punch through the asphalt layer <laughs> and what the ethical aspect of it uh, that, I, that part of the question I do not fully uh, understand because uh, well let uh, plants are strong and if they want if they, the seeds and the plant punches through the asphalt, yeah, that is what happens. That is, they seek all kinds of places where they can exist. And uh, we, we mind or we don't mind, that that's, that's not, a, not a point that they are just there. And if they can survive, they, they do this. Okay. Um, another question in the email. Influencing polarity, I think we also see with the so-called illusionists. Is that so? And only don't they know what they are doing? Well, I'm, I'm not so uh, familiar with all those illusionists, but what I do know is that some of them are uh, doing illusionistic things by being very clever uh, with mirrors and with all kinds of things, which I also, when I was a... A young boy, I also got a box with all these tricks you could play on your parents. And some of them uh, were really uh, things that were very clever, thought out things with mirrors and so on. But also that you had to uh, um, draw their attention to something and in the meantime do something else. So it is a lot of trick work, I would say. But... I explained already with the uh, changing of polarity that there are people that are also able to uh, to change their polarity on uh, purpose themselves, and uh, they can uh, they can levitate. But uh, I think these are very few few people, and uh, it is a very famous story uh, in the time of Gautama the Buddha when he lived that people asked this question to him whether it would be useful to learn this uh, trick of uh, changing your polarity so you could float and, uh, for instance, cross a river by uh, levitating. And he said, if you take this effort, what would it be of value? He said, if I pay so many cents, I can take the ferry to the other side of the river and that is what the value of it is. 
what is the use of this yeah. to focus your attention on that? Yeah. And so you can, uh, because it takes a lot of training and all kinds of things to be able to do that. So what is the use of that if you can do so many other things to help others? Yeah. So this is really an ethical question and uh, whether the people who are able to do this uh, consciously or self-consciously or not, that is, uh, that could also be a point of to think about. But actually, my um, reaction on what is the use of these things, why should we focus on this, is a more uh, uh, more important question, I think. And uh, well, the Buddha has given the answer. I fully uh, agree with this answer because uh, there are so many other things that are of important to develop other than um, trying to uh, levitate, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful answer. Um, the person who asked you uh, about radiant matter thanks you for your answer. And then I've got the last question for tonight. Um, that is the goal in time. Will the conflicts be gone? It's not really on this. Sorry, sorry, the goal in time? What is the goal in time? Will conflicts be gone? Ah, but that, that is, let us say, oh, well, I can say something about this. Of course, this is more a matter of human thought and human mentality and human behavior, whether wars will stop and so on. We have been uh, giving lectures on that, but also we had our uh, Lucifer magazine, the special, which we issued last year on uh, uh, on peace solutions. Uh, so if you want to have interesting views and also keys how to do away with war and conflicts in the world, then this is an interesting issue. It is on the internet, uh, also in English, and you can download it just from our website. So it's uh, free, freely available. Uh, but what, what is a valid question is, because this is a series of lectures on science, and especially on spiritual science, is what is the uh, position of scientists in relation to ethical issues? And I, um, we had a study a week ago with a group of uh, people, and then we talked already a little bit about the subject of today. And then uh, I gave, two weeks back, I gave an example of a scientist um, uh, that was, uh, 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 his name was Shaq, um, I forgot his, his last name now. Um, he he was he was a scientist that worked on the Manhattan Project in the in the Second World War, so a nuclear arms project. But he changed his idea. He was a brilliant uh, physicist, uh, and he changed his course of work. And he only wanted to work on things that would solve problems that which would bring humanity further. And last week, when we during the study, we also talked about uh, a very famous German uh, physicist, Hans Peter Dürr. Uh, he was for many years the director of the Max Planck Institute in Munich, but he also was a very famous person for um, putting on the agenda of the function of the scientists in society, what they should focus on, and from a certain conference, of which he was one of the initiators, they started a movement, or they had a conference with more than 3,000 scientists from all over the world, to start to work on abandoning nuclear arms in the world, for instance. And uh, make guidelines for nuclear energy in order to safeguard humanity from disasters and terrible warfare uh, based on 
technical development in the, in the field of nuclear science. So you see that uh, development of science always comes with new ethical and moral issues that cannot be addressed early enough in order to prevent that the progress of science leads to uh, to, to uh, developments for humankind which are uh, working backward and bringing big disasters in, in, instead of bringing the development of mankind and of all living beings on earth and bringing balance and prosperity and, and evolution of consciousness of all men and living beings. And that is what I would like to conclude on this series of lectures on spiritual science that in the beginning I've said that science is universal science, spiritual science is a science that is a synthesis of science as we know it, the material science, but also of philosophy and of religion. And it should be the combination of these three, the synthesis of these three, that are of utmost importance. And the religious aspect is in fact coinciding with the ethical and moral aspects and the issues that we should face in a very early stage of new developments of science. And I started my lecture with explaining a very important remark of one of the masters who was saying that if you develop science in such a way that it contributes to the evolution of mankind, and if it is universal science and ethical sound science, then it will not only contribute now to the development of all living beings, but it will contribute on a very long run for centuries. It will benefit mankind. And that is the focus that we should try to get. What is the science that has this in its, in its potential? Thank you, Joop. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful conclusion. Yeah. These were questions. Okay. Thank you so much for your very good questions and remarks. It really uh, was an extension of the lecture, I think. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think now we are going to uh, <coughs> conclude um, this uh, um, series. I want to announce that next week we have our last study meeting based on the lecture of today. Uh, I have drafted uh, some reading material. It's not really necessary to read it, but it is, well, it is very interesting to read it. Um, so hopefully you will join the study of uh, next week uh, because I've, I really like the study of uh, last week, Sunday. Uh, after this uh, study of next week, we will start with the lecture on lectures, plural, on the theme of the universal symbols, the language of the soul. And on the 16th of April, the first lecture will be on the circle, the triangle and the cross, followed by a lecture on that and uh, subsequent uh, lectures and studies. I'm now going to conclude this evening with the, um, with the Gayatri from the Rig Veda, and it runs as follows. O thou golden sun of most excellent splendor, illumine our hearts and fill our minds, so that we, recognizing our oneness with the divinity, which is the heart of the universe, may see the pathway before our feet, and tread it to those distant goals of perfection, stimulated by thine own radiant light. <laughs>